Hi, 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 hi. Sorry, I'm late. Let me see if I can get to the live chat over here. All right. So tonight, I'm going to talk about uh, Riley Strain's bank card was found by the river, actually in the bank of the river. I'm going to talk about a mom and two kids found dead in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we're going to talk about Chad Daybell's upcoming trial, which starts on April 1st. And we're going to talk about a murder-suicide that happened on a Michigan highway back in 2018. Uh-oh. Spaghetti eyes that just went on. Hopefully that just started me from the beginning. I'm hoping. Let me see. Way back in 2018. Sorry, I'm late. Let me see if I okay. get to the right. live chat. Sorry, I thought I thought it wasn't working. All right, so tonight. So I'm so happy. So many of you are here to watch. Even though I'm very late. Hi, Margo. Oh, there we go. We just took a jump. Okay, I don't know. All right, let's get right down to it and uh, talk about this because. get over here. So this, we're going to talk about this mother and two young children that were found dead in their Charlotte, North Carolina home on Friday. A man suspected in their deaths was arrested a little more than 24 hours later. And guess where he was? California. Markayla Johnson, 22, and her children, four-year-old Miracle and seven-month-old Messiah, Miracle and Messiah, were found dead Friday afternoon. They were reported missing on March 3rd. It's not clear why they were not found at that time. So, uh, wow, they were reported uh, missing on March 3rd. I don't understand that at all, but the Charlotte Mecklenburg police didn't put out a notice about the family until March 8th. Police found the remains while executing a search warrant at the home, which was in an apartment in Northeast Charlotte. Police didn't say why they waited two weeks to search the apartment. And then Benjamin Taylor, 35, was found in Imperial County, California, Saturday night. He wasn't far from the border of Mexico. He was taken into custody on three counts of murder and one count of concealing a death, and he is now awaiting extradition back to North Carolina. Police, <laughs> they haven't said much on this one. They haven't even say how they identified Benjamin Taylor as the suspect or how they gained information that he was in California. But um, police chief Johnny Jennings said that Taylor had been in a relationship with Markayla Johnson. So very sad news there. Now let's go on to um, Riley Strain and the latest on his case. Now he is the college student from Missouri that was visiting Nashville with his fraternity and he went to Luke Bryan's bar. He only was served one drink and someone said he was thrown out of there. There's some video surveillance of him outside the bar. But now his bank card's been found on the riverbank. So, and we talked about this earlier in the video earlier today. But let's see what, um, we have to talk about here. So I want to get to, he was last seen just over a week ago being asked to leave Luke Bryan's bar downtown for being intoxicated. He's a six foot seven finance major and he left Luke's 32 bridge on Broadway just after 9.30 p.m. 
and he got escorted out of the bar for intoxication. Unfortunately, he walked in the opposite direction of his hotel, about five blocks the other way. His friends had not immediately left the bar with him, and again, he was in town with his fraternity. Surveillance video shows that Strain was headed up 3rd Avenue alone. He can be seen crashing into a pole off of Church Street and then stumbling onto Gay Street near the river, holding his head in some of the footage. Surveillance video last captures him on Gay Street near the James Robertson Bridge. Now, investigators have not released that specific video to the public. So one of the last people who potentially saw him before his trail stops, and it's a homeless man, spoke for the first time on what he saw, okay? And he said, we heard a commotion. I'm quoting him. And this man, again, is part of the homeless population that lives near the river with his wife down an embankment from Gay Street. And he said, and I quote, we looked back up. He almost fell over. The last bush right there caught him. He was very, very, very intoxicated. I never seen anybody stumble that hard before. He said he didn't head closer to the street to check on strain since someone else was already there. And I quote, he said, I yelled up. They said, he's just drunk. He's okay. Now, this man said he reported this entire encounter to detectives and to Riley Strain's family. He said that Strain continued in the same direction up First Avenue. However, that's where Strain's trail stops. No other footage or cell phone activity go beyond that point. And that was around 10 p.m. Other security footage just a block up from the Justice A.A. Birch building doesn't appear to show Strain pass by, according to his family. His relatives, including both of his biological parents, have been in town since the first day of the search, and they said they are now focusing on tracking down anyone who was in Strain's last known area by the bridge, whether they were walking on a scooter, taking a ride share, or driving by. So anyone who may have seen Strain should contact Metro Police at 615-742-7463. Now let's talk about the bank card being found. The parents of Riley Strain are asking for your help. It's been one week. Okay, Saturday morning crews searched along the Cumberland River. On uh, the Office of Emergency Management, say they utilized a dive team, canine drones, and sonar technology to try to find Riley, but there's been no sign. However, on Sunday afternoon, Riley's bank card was found on the embankment between Gay Street and the Cumberland River. In the meantime, Riley's parents and step-parents, who prefer simply parents, say they won't stop until they find him. His mother, Michelle, said, I haven't talked to my boy for over a week, and it's hard. She says they texted or FaceTimed every day. That tells you right there what kind of a kid he truly is, said his mother, Millie Gilbert. So they found the bank card and let's see over here. The bank card, who found it? Let's see. Metro Nashville Police Department got a clue when they found Strain's bank card on the embankment of the Cumberland River Sunday afternoon. So his bank card was discovered on the embankment between Gay Street at the Cumberland River. They don't say 
You know, did they just find the bank card? Hadn't they searched? There's so many questions, right? Was there any activity on it? What was the last, you know, I know they can't tell you all that. Um, very odd. Uh, here is. There he is. Um, I don't know. His father, stepfather Chris Whited said this is definitely the worst nightmare. He talks to his mom three or four times a day. For him to go this long without talking is not normal by any means. sound good right not seeing him and all of that I don't know oh. it's upsetting huh and six foot seven you know six foot seven foot guys and not uh you know, somebody that doesn't stand out, right? He stands out. I don't know. You know that there was, you know, we were just talking about panthers and all that stuff. A group, uh, this is crazy. So, a group of cyclists in their 50s and 60s. I'm just going to put this here because there's a pretty gruesome image, which I'm not going to put on, but we'll put this one up. And just look at these cyclists over here when I tell you what they did. These women were 19 miles into a bike ride when a really scary uh, situation happened, okay? A cougar, you heard me right, a cougar launched at one of their friends and clamped down on her face during a team ride on a vast Washington State Trail last month. So the five cyclists are talking about how they tried to pry the mountain, uh, the cougar, off of their friend using just rocks, sticks, and their own hands. This happened February 17th on a trail northeast of Falls City in Washington. The friends were all part of a competitive recycled bikes racing team. And they were 19 miles into their biking trip when that wild animal lunged at 60-year-old Kerry Bergeret, and tackled her into a shallow ditch off the trail with the cougar biting her jaw. 
She said, I thought my teeth were coming loose and I was going to swallow my teeth. I could feel the bones crushing and I could feel it tearing back. I felt like it was suffocating me and she could taste blood in her mouth, she said. And this is a picture of what happened to her face. Um, there's also a picture of them where they are sitting on top of a bike with a mountain lion underneath it where they trapped the mountain lion, not mountain lion, the cougar. Okay, so she suffered trauma to her face and permanent nerve damage from the attack. And Anna Tits, Tits, sorry, <laughs> I am sorry, sorry, Anna Tits, 59, dropped a 25-pound rock on the cougar's head. She did this numerous times, and she did this while trying to avoid hitting her friend. Can you imagine this? A 25-pound rock. Do you realize the weight of that? And she is hitting the cougar with the 25-pound rock while the cougar is biting her friend's face. Crazy, right? So um, then she tried to jab her fingers up the animal's nostrils and in his eyes. Finally, after 15 minutes, the animal let up and Bergeret was able to crawl away. Then Tish Williams, also 59, grabbed the $6,000 bike of 51-year-old Erica Wolf, and the group used it to pin down the mountain puma for 30 minutes before a Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife police officer arrived and shot the creature between the shoulder blades. And Bergeret said, all these ladies came up with superhuman strength. She said, and I quote, they're teeny ladies, and I know that the fish and wildlife shot the final shot to kill it, but these ladies killed that cougar with their bare hands and no weapons. I'm eternally grateful to each one of them. The male cougar was about one year old and weighed 75 pounds, according to the fish and wildlife officials. The animal did not have rabies or significant issues that would lead to aggressive behavior, according to the department. Wow. And there is a picture of them sitting on top of this with the bike. This is crazy. And they really are. They're, are. they're all tiny, tiny women. So amazing, right? Okay, so. That was nuts, 25 pound rock. Okay, let's talk about Chad Daybell and then we're gonna talk about that Michigan incident. Let me just see what you guys are doing. Okay. Lovely lyrics, it's a YouTube glitch. What's a YouTube glitch? What happened? Hi, Marianne. He was six foot seven, right, Marianne? Hi, Murder of Crows. Hi, Canadian girl. Hi, everybody. Hi, it's Bank. Kevin Leonard, thank you for coming in. I'm sure they didn't expect that. No. What happened? Um, it does, Kevin. It shows a picture of it crushed under the bike. Which I didn't want to put. Some people don't like to see that, you know. Your chat just stopped showing comments. 
Oh, yeah. I don't know what's going on. Try to, uh, just, all you can do is refresh it. It happened to mine, too. I think it's, I don't know what YouTube is doing. Sorry about that so much. Lovely lyrics. Okay. So let's go on to Chad Zabel. Chad Daybell. You might remember that Lori Daybell's trial was not live streamed, right? Just the audio, it was wacko, and it was around the same time that we were streaming um, Letitia Staug's trial last year, which we were streaming every day. And, well, Chad's is going to be different, okay? His murder trial will be live streamed. And it's going to begin in just two weeks. But however, there's going to be, if you want to go to the Ada County Courthouse in person, yeah, there's going to be some really big uh, strict rules about this. So anybody that wants to watch this in person must abide by an administrative order. Judge Stephen Boyce issued the order as part of the final preparations for jury selection, and that's due to start April 1st. The order is similar to one that Judge Boyce signed before Lori Vallow Daybell's trial last year and lays out rules for those attending the trial in person. They're going to have an online ticketing system. That's going to be used for anybody that wants to get a seat in the courtroom. So attendees will log on to the Daybell section of the Ada County website the business day before they want to attend and reserve a seat on a first come basis they have to go to this section reserve a seat there's going to be no priority no designated seating for the media and standing not allowed in the courtroom and unlike Lori Vallow Daybell's trial guess what they're not having any overflow rooms those who do not get a courtroom ticket are encouraged to watch the proceedings online. All spectators will have to follow the courtroom order, including these key points. Everyone will be screened through security. Handbags, backpacks, and other items will be inspected. Cell phones and other electronic devices must be off or in silent mode, and they cannot record, photograph, or transmit sounds images or video from the courtroom. The people attending cannot wear buttons or any items that display messages of any kind. Any activity or behavior which is found to be disruptive may result in removal from the courtroom. So Judge Boyce is allowing the trial to be live streamed with court operated cameras. And the trial is expected to last eight to 10 weeks. Chad Daybell could face the death penalty if found guilty. Okay, so you know that. And let me just go over here. Okay, so let me go on. I'm on the Ada County the Daybell section of the Ada County Courthouse, and it says uh, orders, okay, orders governing conduct. Let's see here. It says reservations are not available at this time. Reservations can only be made one day at a time. One day at a time. And will only be accepted on the business day prior to the date of the hearing. You will be asked to provide your name, email, and mobile telephone number. All requests will be processed on a first-come, first-served basis. Tickets are limited to one ticket per name and email address. Approved attendees must, will receive a confirmation email with further instructions. Confirmed attendees must bring their reservation 
confirmation email, and a government-issued ID with photograph as proof of, edu uh, proof of identification. The reservation will be valid for the entire business day. Seats cannot be transferred to another person or agency representative unless approved by trial court administration. Okay, any changes? Blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Fast for cameras, reference. Let's see what else they have over here. Daybell Trial Courtroom 400. The trial for State v. Chad G. Daybell will be held at the Ada County Courthouse in Courtroom 400. Courtroom 400. Okay, so we will be following. Yes, we will. Okay, now I want to talk about, let's see if I find it. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Okay. So maybe some people remember this, maybe they don't. But this happened January 6th of 2018 in Ionia County, Michigan. Let's see, and the call came in, the first 911 call came in. Let me, oh, let me put this, let me put this visual here. Okay, so the call came in to 911, the first one at 9.37 p.m. Again, January 6, 2018. And it was a male on the phone who said that he saw that there were two people on the side of the road and said they were west of the 60-mile marker. And the man said, and I quote, it looked like there were three of them waving for help. By the time we noticed them, we couldn't turn around. And then another 911 call, and it was a woman this time. And she said that there was a van on the side of the road, and it looked like the back hatch was open, and she said that things were strewn everywhere. But she said there were no lights. It just looked kind of funny. And then at 9.56 p.m., a male called and said that he was a driver for a store and that he was heading on 96 East and came past a car and there was a person standing out there frantically trying to flag someone down. Now the dispatcher of nine, the 911 says like, oh wait, is that um, around the 60 mile marker? Did you see it was a van? And the person says, yes. And they said, okay, well, we have uh, help on the way. And that help was a deputy named Tyler Cole. And he arrived there at 10.01 p.m. So from the time that first came in, 9.37 to 10.01, okay? So it was almost 30 minutes, right? And this deputy expected, okay, some people have car trouble, what, they have a flat tire, what's going on, right? But... He pulls up and he finds the vehicle pulled over. He sees the back hatch of the vehicle is open and he sees an empty long gun case on the ground. And next to that, he saw a box of Remington shotgun shells. And then in the snow, not too far from the vehicle, he saw a woman, Lisa Summers, who is laying face first she had both of her arms out and 
It appeared she had been shot in the left side of her head. And then another person face down in the snow. It was a man, David Summers, and a portion of his head was missing. So Deputy Cole uh, gets his gun drawn, right? This looks like a really serious situation. And he goes to the vehicle to see if there's anyone there. And he finds someone in the back seat and part of her face is missing. And he said she wasn't moving and didn't appear to be breathing. And he thought she was dead. So he called into, uh, you know, his dispatch and he said, there's another in the car. I've got two on the ground. And then he looked into the woods because he didn't know, you know, who shot these people, where they were. So he was looking around the snow for footprints and um, he didn't see anything beyond the people that were already there. So he said he thinks he has everyone. He didn't see any other tracks. And then he went to his patrol car and he grabbed a medical kit and he put on gloves. He went back and he checked for a pulse on the woman that was laying face down in the snow and he couldn't find one and she was cold. And then he went to the man that was lying on the ground in the ditch and he had been shot in the head. And he was saying, who shot you? And then the woman that was in the car said, there's two dead bodies, she heard someone say. So she started screaming and screaming and hitting everything. And Deputy Cole said he saw the movement in the vehicle and the woman that was in there who had been missing part of her face was waving her right hand. So he went to the passenger door and she sat up and reached for his hand. And the deputy said, uh, you know, crap. And she said, I'm right here. And then more officers arrived. They shut down the highway. A media was asked her name and officers thought she said her name was Annie. Her mouth was all destroyed by the shotgun blast. And she said, I'm cold. And somebody wrapped her in a blanket. And then the deputy asked, or another officer said, who shot you? But they couldn't understand what she said. So they said, did he or did she shoot you? And she said, he shot me. And another uh, Sergeant Philip Hesch is a detective from the Ionia County Sheriff's Department says he was watching a movie in Grand Rapids and he got a call about the shooting so he stopped you know grabbed his car ran out there and he said that this scene was so unsettling it was just a really desolate part of the highway with nothing but woods and farm fields and the sky was black. The weather was so cold, just horrible. It was like a negative nine degrees. And he said, we had to be out there for hours in that weather. This was a detective who had been a detective since 2009. And he said this was the first time he had ever encountered anything like this. And I quote, he said, it was brutal. That night was probably one of the worst scenes that I've ever been on. And he said that several things didn't make sense to him in the initial assessment of the scene. You know, like, where was the murder weapon? And why were there bloody smears on the steering wheel? And 
around the outside of the vehicle. So he was thinking, okay, well, let's see, you know, what happened here? And thought maybe that the victims had been chased around, you know, as if they're some kind of game, you know, running around the car. And everything was freezing. So instead of having fresh blood, it's frozen blood. Everything was ice cold. It was uh, horrible cold. The, the kind of cold that, you know, you get frostbite. Your skin hurts. That was very dark. And they had to use flashlights and floodlights to see everything. When they moved the man, David... Spotty, that's when they found the gun. It was under him, and it was a 12 gauge Remington shotgun, a pump action shotgun. And the positioning of the gun and Detective Hesh's viewpoint thought okay, this is a murder suicide. They checked the man's pockets. And they found that he had a wallet, and inside the wallet he had $205. They tried to piece this together by looking for clues in the vehicle to see what was going on here. And there's another view there of the vehicle. So inside the vehicle, what they found were, um, there were two uh, insulated coolers and there were cans of beer and there was a small bottle of Fireball cinnamon whiskey. They also found a blue purse and it had the woman who was face down in the snow, Lisa Summers, wallet. It had her driver's license, and it had $385 in cash. And it also had two receipts from a Norwegian cruise line. And then there were two suitcases in the back of the vehicle. And those, that, those suitcases, they had cruise luggage tags. And the suitcases were stained with blood. So from all of that, police assumed and, well, more than assumed, they were able to determine that David, Lisa, and Amidi were coming from the Grand Rapids airport. Okay. But why were these three people who they were from Kaliva, which is a northern village in Manistee County, on Interstate 96 near Saranac on a Saturday night, because that's the wrong direction to where they live, right? So they, they had to keep looking for anything that could help them figure this out. And in the meantime, an ambulance was there, okay? And it had uh, picked up a meaty and put her in the ambulance, and they were on their way to Spectrum Butterworth Hospital, which is in Grand Rapids. Now, I don't think anybody there expected that woman to live at all. Uh, remember, half of her face was, like, gone. And... Um, this detective, Hesh, he was picking up pieces of her teeth, okay, and her face off the highway. But uh, she didn't die. Nope. Two days later, 
She was in a critical care unit at Spectrum Butterworth Hospital. Her name now, known as Amita Dewey, she was alert, but she couldn't see out of either of her eyes. Doctors already performed several surgeries on her. They were trying to put her face back together. She had screws trying to hold the pieces of bone together. But she could think. She could think. And that was amazing. Because the shotgun, the bullet from the shotgun missed her brain. It damaged her upper palate, both of her eyes, her jaw, and half of her face. She had a trach, so she couldn't speak, but she could hear voices. And to communicate, she used sign language. She used her hands. But staff and the police really couldn't figure out what she was doing. And then someone had the idea to hand her a paper and a pen. And she was so happy because um, she felt like she had been playing a game of charades, right? She wrote on the paper a question to the doctor. And that question was, will I ever see again? And the doctor basically said, no. And she just laughed. And she wrote, watch me. Now on three days later, on January 11th, she was transferred out of the critical care unit. And she was even able to stand up briefly. The next day, she was able to eat some and swallow some ice chips. On the 13th of January, five days later, she walked down the hallway back to her room. And she was able to have friends and family visit her. She got audiobooks to listen to because she couldn't see. And she didn't want to watch a movie without, you know, she didn't want to just listen to a movie. So she started to get audiobooks. They were trying to save her left eye, um, but it was really failing and it was excruciatingly painful. So doctors talked to her about their options and she agreed to have an eye removed and then when she did the vision in her right eye improved and so the doctors thought okay the her brain had been working so hard to restore the vision to both eyes but once they removed the left eye it was uh some vision returned to the right eye. So, and a bit, she was able to see a little bit again. And and then she saw the first color and the first color she saw was red. So they, uh, Detective Hesch and a partner went to the hospital and they started to interview Amiti. And th there wasn't any trial because, okay, David Sum Summers was the main suspect and he was dead. Right? So... They didn't know, they didn't want to talk too much about this. And it was a media that said, no, 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 no. We're going to talk about this. And you can ask anything you want. And she told them not just what happened that night, but she told them about why this all happened to begin with. 
and the officers just found like, wow, this this girl is you know remarkable because um, she told the the whole truth, even even stuff where she was involved in it. She didn't uh, minimize that for anyone, and she admitted that she confronted David in the car, and she screamed at him, which just like increased his anger. And everything she told these officers, everything she told these detectives was, you know, it fit perfectly with the autopsy report. And everything they saw at the scene and the, the 911 calls, everything. And the story that she told the officers explained the stuff they found. Why were there bloody smears on the outside of the vehicle? And that is because she got out of the vehicle two times, leaving those bloody tracks and the blood on the outside of the vehicle. She felt her way around it. She was fighting to live. And she was only 18 and a high school senior. She said she was not going to die. You know, she was not going to let herself, her life be over for him. There was no way she was going to die on that, that highway. No way. So they asked her, you know, why didn't David go on that cruise? And Amidi said that her mother and stepfather planned to drive from Michigan to Florida to go on a cruise. And Amidi was sleeping during the drive and said that they had stopped in Kentucky. And when they were stopped in Kentucky, David had some kind of massive conniption, meltdown, fit, whatever, okay, but the... Uh, Detective Hesch wrote, the, and I quote, massive meltdown in his report. And he said that he was going to drive back to Michigan. And Amidi was relieved. You know, she was ecstatic because this was her stepfather and she didn't really like him. And she said she never really liked him. And so it's great. You know, he's going to go, go, go back to Michigan. Go, 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 go. And... Amidi and her mother rented a car and they went the rest of the way. Goodbye, David. See you later. Okay. And they drove on to Florida from, from Kentucky. Okay. And he's gone. Bye. And her mother said, if you weren't here with me, you know, I would have never had the strength to do this. I would have went back to Michigan with him. And, you know, it was wonderful. So... That made Amidi feel like kind of weird because she's thinking like, wait a second though, if my mother would have just went back up, would she still be alive, you know? But anyway, this uh, Carnival Cruise left from Cape Canaveral in Florida, December 30th of 2017. And Lisa and Amidi took day trips to Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. And Amidi only wanted one thing for her birthday, and that was to touch the ocean for the first time in, in all of her life. So they went to the beach. And she can remember walking in the water. And it was like bath water, she said. And she said it was so clear. She could see the bottom. And her mother walked with her and they held hands and they just stood there and they enjoyed the view. And they remembered looking at the water and the sky and everything was so beautiful and so calm. And they had such a wonderful time. And... And that was, you know, that was a media Amida in red. And that was her grandma, Pat Foster, and her mother, Lisa Summers. And that was uh, 
in Nassau, Bahamas on December 31st of 2017. I'm not sure exactly how her grandmother got on the trip, but about halfway through the trip, Lisa, Amidi's mother, spoke to David on the phone. And he said that he was having surgery to get a brain tumor removed through his nose. And Amidi didn't even think that her mother knew about this because she never, ever brought it up before this. So she thinks she just found out. But she said that her mother was extremely worried for him. And two days later, David sends Lisa a photo. And his entire nose was bandaged up. And, and you know, he sends her that picture. Let's see. Okay. Three weeks after the shooting, Amidi starts to review news reports about the shooting. Some of the 911 calls had been posted online. Amidi ended up listening to those. She was thankful to everyone who called in and saved her life. She really wanted to find the callers on Facebook to thank them personally. She got her boyfriend to read news reports about the shooting. And what she found out were several of those stories about it were so wrong. And that just made her so mad and infuriated her. And so they left out things. And... There were things about David, things about her stepfather. And when she read his obituary, that that made her so upset too because it didn't mention that he killed her mother and that he shot her in the face. And she felt like it just... It was like it didn't happen. So instead, his obituary told about how he organized softball leagues in Kaliva and that he enjoyed baseball and hunting, snowmobiling, and that he loved his family. And that was it. She couldn't take that anymore. Loved his family. And then it said he was preceded in death by his wife, Lisa. And she thought, yeah, uh, yeah, why? Because you killed her? So she was really upset that the obituary didn't, wasn't clear of what this man did and instead, you know, acted as if he was this great guy and he was preceded in death by his wife. And, you know, she, they were getting like comments on it. Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. And she was getting very, very upset with, had nobody knew what really happened. So she didn't want pity, but she felt he killed her mother and that, you know, it wasn't right, not at all. And then there were posts, you know, about David talking about you know, Lisa, the the wife he killed as a soulmate, and they met playing softball and all this stuff. And, and she was just very upset because, look, this is a man who had just blown off half of her face, and this is, he's he's being portrayed, not, this, not, nobody knows what really happened here. So, then... When Amidi started to go on social media and she felt like her mother was under attack because people were saying, you know how people are in the comments, 
Well, why did Lisa go on this trip if her husband was having brain surgery, if he was having surgery to remove a brain tumor? And there was so much like judgment and hate. And Amita said, That's, they ridiculed my mother. And I wanted to scream that she didn't know this. And um, she said to everybody on, you know, everybody online seemed to be, you know, putting the focus on her mother and blaming her for being uncaring. She didn't stay with her husband. who was having brain surgery and all that. And then Amidi thought, wait a minute, this whole tumor story, maybe this isn't real. And she went through things and never, and she looked and there was, there was no paperwork and there was no test results and there wasn't even the name of a doctor. And she said, oh my gosh, he faked this all. He faked it all. And uh, the police say, yes, they believe that David had a motive for faking the tumor and not going on the cruise. And that's because he had a mistress. And he was with his mistress. So this gets crazier and crazier, right? Now, two months, Amidi had to stay in the hospital. She had at least 15 different facial surgeries. Um, she said it was, it was, she was in misery having some of those surgeries. And after two months, she spent a week in Ann Arbor for another major surgery because she was missing so much bone and tissue in the side of her face. The doctors at U of M wanted to refill it. Plastic surgeons helped, and um, they took muscle from her back and put it on her face. And the muscle looked huge on her face. And she said that they can take it out, some of it, but they can never put more in. So that uh, still had its problems. It sagged and they had to have another operation to lift it. And it became a running theme in her life that she was having one operation after the other. And she was never getting to a point of being done with all this. Okay, not at all. She had uh, one surgery that took two inches of a rib, put it under her eye to um, prepare to make a socket for a prosthetic eye. Let's see, her upper jaw wasn't there. Her teeth were actually eating themselves, she said. It felt like coral. Her face had heavy scars on it. And But she was still going, still going, right? And there's her then, right? And this is her after numerous, numerous surgeries. Um, and that picture was uh, taken at the Kellogg Eye Center in Ann Arbor, June 15th of 2023. She would have uh, dreams. And she thought of the dreams were like an endless loop of what had happened. And she really put her to the point of that she almost wanted to take her own life and she had PTSD and multiple PTSD episodes and if she saw fireworks or a flash of a gun you know she felt oh my gosh I can't breathe I need air I need to get out of here you know and it was fireworks and she collapsed 
while uh, going across the bridge at a hot air festival in 2019. Fireworks went off, paralyzed her. You know, she seriously thought about, you know, jumping off the bridge just to make it stop, to, to make the fireworks stop. She had um, another experience at her brother's wedding, which was a month after that. She took her mother's place in the mother-son dance and danced with her brother. Um, another time, she was at a gas station, a tra trailer went by, she felt that uh, whoosh of air and took her back to standing behind the, on the side of the interstate trying to get help. And she gets a wave of panic and it's just horrible. She had attacks at the beach you know, just, uh, just terrible. And she's always asking herself hypothetical questions. What if she didn't go on the cruise? What if she would have stayed in Midland and went to cheerleading competition? Would her mother still be alive? She blamed herself in a sense. Um, now her mother and stepfather had invited her to go on the cruise. Why it was her 18th birthday? And they had long planned the trip, but Amidi was conflicted about it because she was going to miss this competitive cheer competition. And she loved being on the cheerleading team for Midland High School. And she was really conflicted about going, but she said, and I quote, the team needed me and I was very conflicted about going. So my cheer coach is actually the one that said, hey, you're going to be 18 soon. You only get one chance, just go. So I did. And uh, that, that decision has caused her all kinds of guilt. And she asked herself constantly, you know, if she didn't go, would her mother still be alive? She's went through therapist after therapist, could not find relief. She even went into a crisis center for mental health. She stayed a week there. And um, she started working with a therapist who specialized in working with trauma patients. And the, she, there was a Maltese therapy dog named Ziggy at this therapist's office. And the walls were covered by paintings. Oh, the artist was the therapist herself. And she said, uh, you know, she was so, she didn't, she didn't want to be there. She crossed her arms and, you know, it was just, oh my gosh, I don't want to be here. And she told the therapist about the shooting without any emotion. And the therapist said when she came in, she was just kind of thinking there's no hope. She's in a dark place. She has been through some really rough stuff. And it was almost as if she was standing outside of her body and watching the events unfold and telling her about them. And so she, the, you know, went on to about people that are in deep, deep trauma. You know, they deal with this stuff, survivor's guilt, and um, they're trapped in their trauma and they, have to, they don't have a perspective. To still be able to step outside of it, that was unique in Amita, you know. And that her life is so totally different. You know, she was a cheerleader before this. It is so totally different now. And she kept working with this therapist. And they talked about these trauma triggers, okay? Because they're everywhere. It could be a smell. It could be a feeling. But it just comes on all, all at once on all sides. And you don't know what it is. Every time that she had to have another surgery and there was any pain to her face, it would take her back to being shot. And so her and this therapist worked on everything. And, you know, she worked the more she worked with the therapist, the more relief she got. And she started to rebuild her life and her friends and, and trust, trust in people. And 
this therapist taught her to recognize the triggers. Okay, and it helped her get back in control of her life. So, how would she live without her sight? How would she learn to be independent? All of this stuff, because she had been so, such a different person before. And then the whole world shut down because of COVID, right? And, uh it was crazy. So on Mother's Day of 2020, she was in a really, really dark place. And she reached out to the therapist and said, I, I'm really, really in a dark place. So you there? And they talked for about uh, an hour. And it was like an earthquake building, the therapist said. And there was a lot of tension. And then everything just erupted. And therapist has a mantra and it's happiness is temporary and sadness is temporary. It's like a river. It just keeps going on and going. Some days are better than other days and you just have to have faith that everything is going to be okay. That's what she says. And after about an hour processing all that, Amita was in a better place. And so... You know, they, they went on, and so this is still going on here. Um, here's another picture of Amina, that, because that was 2020. We are in 2024. And this is January 25th of 2024. And she got uh, a new nose because she needed a nose to improve her breathing. And, oopsie, she's legally blind. And let's see here. She reconnected. Let me see here. She already had the surgery once on the, on the nose. Let's see here. So describing a little bit about how they um, performed the uh, operation and they had um, they used parts of her ribs to reconstruct her face uh, muscles from her back different things like that and many plastic surgeons came in techniques from World War One. we're about to help a young woman and the surgery was supposed to last three hours. It went perfect. They removed the rib and they cut a chunk, put it on a tray. It was six centimeters. And they, they started some facial reconstruction. So they really... Uh, She has a lot of scar tissue and they put the rib bone in her nose. And they spent two and a half hours working on the scar cartilage. Far longer than they anticipated and it said that it was the most challenging part of the surgery. And after the scar tissue was removed they gave her the new nose. They picked up the chunk of her rib, put it against her face, and uh, you know, I'm not gonna spare you the details of the chisels and everything, 
that they did because I don't think we have to go there. And when they it was finished and they gave her a mirror, um, she says, I think it's big, but nobody else does. But she hasn't had a nose in five years, so, you know, she was thinking that, let's see. She then started to talk more about her stepfather, this, this man that ended up, you know, trying to kill her mother and her. And she remembers that he would always go and talk about his gun whenever um, something happened. And she remembered that she had a boxer dog and that he was in the garage. And this is back four years before the shooting. And the, uh, the dog clawed the side of the truck. And she said that David freaked out when he saw his truck, grabbed his gun and said, I'm going to shoot him. And immediately he was crying and, and saying, no, no, no. You know, and the mother told him to put the, the uh, gun away. You can buff out the scratches. Um, another time when she was a freshman, in high school, she got into a confrontation with her boyfriend and she said that her stepfather David went in the garage, grabbed the shotgun, walked in the house with it and said, if I don't break up with him, that he's going to shoot him. And she said that terrified her. And now she wants to share these stories because she's saying, well, maybe it'll help someone else that thinks, you know, oh, this is okay. So it's just, um, It's uh, not, not okay. And she said, you know, you think this might not be able to happen to you, could happen to you. Um, and, and then the, the, the police officers that were there still, you know, have not been able to forget this, nor the fact that she survived this. You know, it's just a crazy thing. And I, I mean, I, I was looking at this and reading this, and I was saying, I never heard of this. This is crazy. You would never think someone like this could survive, right? Something, but uh, she did, and, you know, um, here she is here and walking around and She's at the West Shore Community College. And she is a survivor, said the detective who picked her pieces of her face off the highway, Hesh, said the toughest human being I've ever met. She's an advocate. She is pure determination, someone who refused to die, and she is fearless and willing to do, share her story. She is determined, and she has a new nose. But she is still waiting to cry. And the reason that they're trying to get tear ducts and they're trying to go through um, and give her a surgery to drain her tear ducts because all the stuff that's in it can cause an infection and plus she can't cry. So she needs her tear ducts fixed. So, you know, the surgeries still are not ending. But she goes on and she says her boyfriend um, is a boyfriend. And he, they, they're doing Walmart together doing stuff.
she makes breakfast in the morning, you know, even though she's legally blind, she still uses the computers. She's learned um, all of this stuff and there's an amazing story there. And I just uh, don't know now. David was having, so I want to go into this David Sumner's affair because because it doesn't really give us All right, here's the part about the affair, okay? So, when they were coming back from that cruise, they were waiting on a plane and they were stuck at an airport in Florida, okay? They weren't going to fly, they weren't going to drive. They Remember, they rented a car to go down to Florida when they stopped, so... They were going to fly back, okay? And it was one hour delay, then another. And Lisa Sumner's filled her time scrolling through her phone. And she found something strange and said to her daughter, Amidi, what's a snap code? And she said, oh, that's for Snapchat. And she said, oh, your, snap, your stepdad has one. Amidi didn't understand it, you know, because he hated social media. Why would he have that? She didn't get it. And she said, why? And she said, well, uh, her mom used uh, her stepdad's email to get into his Snapchat account. And then she handed her phone to Amidi because she didn't know how to use Snapchat. So anyway, Amidi goes in there and finds a string of uh, messages and photos that made it clear. You know, this is so gross. David was having an affair with one of Amidi's 16-year-old friends. So now Lisa is furious, and she calls David and is screaming at him, screaming, saying, you're horrible, and, and Amidi said she called him every name she could, and... But... Amidi was upset, angry, but she wasn't shocked, okay? She thought something weird was going on, but just didn't have proof of it. So her mom, Lisa, starts going through the messages, finding more notes, more pictures. And David has this teenage mistress, okay? 16 is the age of consent in Michigan. But... He was exchanging messages about starting a family, and they had picked out future baby names, and she was screaming at him on the phone, you know, repeating the words that he wrote to this 16-year-old, saying, why would you say this? How could you do this to me? And then Lisa gets a text message from David, and guess what? It's a photo of him holding the gun. And he tells her, I'll do it. I'll do it now. I'll end it now. But they get on the plane at 5.31 p.m.
And Amidi says that she heard a voice in her head, but it was not her voice. But it told her to tell your mother you love her and tell her you're sorry for being such a rotten child. And she said she told her mother those exact words and her mother laughed and said, you're not a rotten child, you're just mouthy. So then they arrive, they land in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the Gerald R. Ford International Airport. They arrive at 8.25 p.m. Now remember, remember when that 911 call came in, this is 8.25 p.m., right? Amelia has a horrible feeling. She didn't want to go into that car with David, right? She wants, she said to her mother, let's get a ride with someone else. Come on, let's go with someone else. But her mother's like, no, 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 no. I want to go here. Her mother didn't have, you know, wasn't uh, a shrinking violet and anything like that. She was uh, an athlete. She was played softball. You know, she's bold, reckless, fearless. And there's no way she's going to uh, shrink down on this. She wanted to confront David. So he picked them up in a silver 2011 Chevy Equinox. And Lisa says she wants to drive, but David wouldn't let her. Amidi sinks into the back seat on the passenger side behind her mother. And Amidi was not living, okay, with David and her mother. And that was because... She was having issues with David. So she had a legal guardian named Becky Hoon. And she actually contacted her when she got in the back seat. And she was on the phone with her. And she told her, you could cut the air with a knife. The tension is so thick in this vehicle. And let's see here. Hold on. So as David drives away from the airport, Lisa quickly starts up on this affair and they start screaming at each other. And David pushes down on the gas and he says, if I'm going down, you're going down. And they're driving down on this Interstate 96 towards Lansing. And David tells her that hacking into his Snapchat account is a federal offense. And that both Lisa and Amidi could be charged, okay, for breaking into his Snapchat. <coughs> and Amidi said he was just throwing out accusations and just crazy stuff, stuff that didn't even make sense, sense that, that wasn't even true. And she started to stick up for herself, and he's driving very erratically. And she just says, can I ask you a question, one question? Uh, David says, yes. And she says, why a 16-year-old? I don't understand. And she said that that question, David became enraged. He's swerving. He almost hit another car. And he's screaming, you're crazy. And he, um, she, excuse me, she's saying, you're crazy. And he says, do you want to see how crazy? And she screams, yeah, show us how crazy. And then about 20 minutes after leaving that airport on that part of the highway, when he veered that off the road, stopped there, he got out, went around the back of the car, and I don't know how they didn't see that he had his shotgun in there, right? Um, how he didn't have that, he had the long gun case, right? And there they didn't see that, I guess, when they put their suitcases in, or this was something he normally carried in his car, I don't know. Um, kind of uh, crazy, but he he opened their doors 
for them to get out and the mother screams, Amidi, he's got a gun. Get back in the car. And Amidi thought, oh, he'll never do this. He'll, he's, he's threatened this gun so many times. He'll never do this. And she didn't think she was in any real danger, right? She said, you know, he's abused her. He's beaten her black and blue. And still, she never thought he would do anything like this, right? Uh, okay. And she turns her head, and when she turns her head, she hears the shotgun go off. And she said he put the barrel over the back seat to get her. He was aiming at the back of her head. And she turned her head. And if she hadn't done that, she wouldn't be here. And it took her face off, her cheek, her jaw, blew away her eye socket, most of her teeth. And her nose, her optic nerve, you know, wrecked, um, gaping hole in her cheek, and she blacked out. But when she came to, she touched her face, and she felt something, and she said, oh my gosh, she remembered that he shot her, and that he really shot her. Hang on a minute, my computer's locking up. This is a crazy story, right? I mean, it's real, it's not a story, it's, it's did, you, did any of you know about this? This was like um, a mere, let me say, February, March, April, May, June. Seven months before the, uh, before Chris Watts murdered his family. Seven months before. Did you know about this? I didn't, right? So she said that she couldn't see out of her eyes. She saw pure black. Her ears were ringing. And uh, she was vomiting. She remembers thinking there's no way that she was going to let him kill her. She couldn't see her phone. But she told Siri to call 911. And... She tried to say words, but the shotgun bullet had split the roof of her mouth, shattered her front teeth, and she couldn't speak clearly. She climbed into the front seat and grabbed the steering wheel, and that's how the steering wheel had blood smears on it that that police, you know, didn't understand at that time, right? Right. She flashed the lights and honked the horns, hoping someone would stop. She was freezing cold. The temperature, remember, the officer said was uh, negative nine. And she said this his voice kept popping in her head, get help, get help. She climbed out of the car. She felt her way around. That's how she left the bloody footprints and the smears all over there. She thought she couldn't do this. She went back into the vehicle laid down in the back seat. She was bleeding profusely. Nobody stopped. The time kept going by, but she said there was a voice and it kept saying, you can't die like this. You're 18. Fight for your life. And she got up out of the car again and she felt her way around. She went to the road and a truck went by so close to her that that wind that gives her that PTSD nearly knocked her down. She was only wearing a sweatshirt. She was freezing. It's amazing that she was able to have that uh, thing. And, and, and that's the... That's what happened. He was having an affair with a 16-year-old. A 16-year-old. Isn't that crazy? I mean, Wow. That is just crazy. Crazy. Well, 
me see if you're still here. I don't even know if anyone's still here. We have to play word cooking. I can't get back to the live chat. Hang on. That's a really, I have to look into more about that story, but uh, did any of you ever hear that? Uh-oh. Why am I buffering? It says I have an excellent con connection. You're, hi, Emmy. You've never heard this story, Lovely Lyrics. Did anybody hear of this? Marianne, you have never heard of it before. Uh, Hi61 heard something about this. Margo has never heard about it. Um, what did you say? Miracle? Yeah, a miracle, right? Get bids in. Oh, you're joking. Uh-oh. I lost the live chat. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it again. I was just looking at it and then it just went away. Where did you go? Hold on, I'm going to have to go in and find you. Starts on April 1st and Hold on. we're going to talk about... Crazy, isn't it? I want that. I've got to go on. What is going on? All right. Let me, maybe I have to close some of these. Let me close some of these. It's too much. Hang on. Okay. Now you should listen to me. Come on. Come on. Oh my goodness, by the time I get there, you all be. I have left me. Okay. Now I'm back in the live chat as soon as it loads up. Come on. All right. So there you are. Hello, Two Scooter. Hi, Miss Behave. I haven't seen you in so long. How are you? Uh, Scooter, have you ever heard of this, uh, this horrific uh, murder-suicide along that Michigan highway in 2018? What a horrible thing. He was having an affair with a 16-year-old and lied about having brain surgery and all that stuff. Did you ever hear about this? Lovely lyrics said it hurt me just to hear it. I can't imagine living through it. Hi, Rough and Ready. You heard of this story just recently, too? It may be because it was around... Um, Maybe around an anniversary of it. She definitely has a purpose, Lovely Lyric said. Yes. Uh, Scooter, have you heard about this? And she lived not far from Michigan. I wonder if Sharon has heard from this. Heard of this. Horrendous. Hi, Emmy. 
Yeah, we and Margo said we noticed we missed a lot of things today, including uh, Rosemary's. Oh my gosh, Rosemary D. Alessandro's prayer group. Where we're supposed to all go to. Emmy, did you remember the prayer group? That it's terrible that we didn't remember that. And I put it in Slack. To, what did I put it in? Once or twice? Oh my gosh. But it's uh, probably time to play word cookies. Yeah, it's bank, I know, right? All of us, all of us. Complete failures in that. Horrible, horrible bank. Emmy? Yeah, right, Emmy? Again, again, Emmy. Again. Terrible. We should all be ashamed of ourselves. Word cookies. Kevin doesn't care that we should be ashamed of ourselves. Not good. Not good at all. Come on, what is this? Word. Okay. Okay, tell it to stop. Come on. The freak, what's wrong with this thing? I hate, and like they changed it like a mobile thing when we used to play it in full screen. And now they, the only thing that's good is that you can play the daily if you miss it. But we played the daily if you missed it. We played the daily earlier today. For yesterday, we're going to play today's daily now um, because we are. Okay. March 18th. Oh boy. My kids are getting home. Uh, from Italy today. Tomorrow's Ray's birthday. Not t tomorrow. The 19th is Ray's birthday. Got to decide what I'm going to do. I've got a... Got so many medical things to do in April. I'm sort of worried about a few things. Hi, Paint It Black. I'm glad you're here.
Hmm. Okay, so let's see here. Cult. Cult. Right. And a loot. Okay, and... last night it didn't let me have my advancement that we were robbed of our advancement it let me have it but it didn't let me have a real advancement There's no A. What is it? What is it? Okay.
Come on. Let's go. I already have ire. Um, Calm down, sweetheart. I'm trying to. Have a drink of water, sweetheart. Good one, high 61. Calm down, sweetheart. How about you drink some water? Cherry on the top. Okay, what's the next one? What's the next one, guys? Infer. In... No, oh, shoot. See, I don't like when it has enough. Mind of its own. Very good, High 61. Do you play this game, High 61? Or do you just play it here? This looks like the same thing. Dress again. Press. Pressed. Okay, dress. No, yeah. Press. Do we do press? Okay. Um, seed. Uh oh. Seeds. Um, let's see. Stop it. Seder. Seders. Mm. Is this the exact same one? Guys, is this the same one? Why is this like the same one? It's almost, right? Seems like this is a mix of ones that we just did with Speed and Sped. Why is this almost exactly like what we just, just did?
I did see it.
Incon, very good. Who's who that high? 61? No, Kevin Leonard. Eva Poole. We haven't seen you in ages. Where have you been? How's it going? Good to see you. Eva Poole coming back in. We got it at the same time. I sixty one. Oh, I'm praying. Um, I pray it's good news too, Native Libra, and prayers for you. I hope it's good news.
Ayan po. Fine. I've had a few person I could not handle any true crime and then really hit hard so I took a break. Oh, I'm glad you're back, Eva. Sorry to hear you went through so much stuff. I hope things are easing up a little bit for you. Okay, I think we're going to go call it a night because we have to go to sleep because I have a big, big day tomorrow. Um, White Angel, if you hear me, my love, I sent your payment requests for your things. I'm going to get your shipping. Uh, Sandra M., I should have your payment request in tomorrow. Um, Sandra M., I also have a question for you because... I found another Gone with the Wind uh, that was supposed to be in that set. So if you want to check your email on that, thank you so much. And we'll see you very soon. Eva, it was very nice to see you again. Don't be a stranger. Love you guys. God bless. Prayers for all that need them. We'll see you um, tomorrow. And everybody be good. Love you guys. God bless. Have a sweet night. Day. Day night, day night, day night, day night, day night. Have a good night.